Hello everyone and thank you for joining me for part 6 of the full stack Apollo GraphQL with React and Node tutorial. Today we're going to focus on context and authentication. And I know I promised at the end of the last episode that we would end up going on to the client side of things in this, um, in this video, but actually using uh, the context to authenticate users is one of the most important parts, or in my opinion, it's one of the most meaningful things that you can do with the Apollo server. So I think I'd be doing you a disservice by not including it. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to cover authentication. And this will actually be uh, part one of two videos. In this first video, we're just going to use a simple authentication method to check, to check out how the context on the Apollo server works to authenticate users. And the next time in the next video will be a little bit more strict. We'll use a JSON web token to authenticate users and to give them access to methods that they wouldn't have access to had they not been logged in. Anyway, without, uh, without, going, without rambling on too much, let's go to the Apollo docs, go to the section called Write Your Grass Resolvers. That's where we finished off last time. And you'll recall last time we finished off by paginating our queries. And that way we could load small chunks of data onto the page at a single time so that we could quickly interact with the data without having to wait long times for the page to load. But today we're going to start from here. Sorry, not there yet. Authenticate users. So right off the bat, what we need to do is we need to pass in a context to the GraphQL server. And we're given the code to do that right here. So what is that going to do for us? Well, it says here, the context function on your Apollo server instance is called with the request object, and this is important, each time a GraphQL operation hits your API. right? And we're always hitting that single GraphQL API. And we can use the request object to read the authorization headers. So if you've ever made a request to a remote API and you needed to have some sort of API token, you know that you had to attach that token to your authorization header. Right? And we can authenticate the user within this context function. And once the user is authenticated, we can put the user on the context. Right here it says attach the user to the object returned from the context function, but I'm going to say going forward we will put the user on the context. And if there's a user on the context, then we can allow that user access to methods that, like I said, they normally wouldn't have had they not been logged in and authenticated. All right, so let's go ahead and grab that context code here and paste it into our index.js file. Right, we're going to pass it into our Apollo server right above the type defs. So let's do that. We're not going to use this method to validate emails. You can figure out something on your own later if you want to. All right, so basically what this method does is it says that if you have headers attached to the request, then grab the authorization header value, which should be the token, and set it to or set your auth string equal to that. Otherwise, you're just going to leave auth as an empty string. And then you're going to decode that token value, which will have your email information encoded within it. We'll decode it, and we'll get our email in a, in a readable form. OK, and then we'll use that email value to, well, let's just continue on before we talk too much about that. So first what we want to do is we want to see if there is a user in the database with that email. Right? And we're not going to use this method because, remember, we created a simple mock database and that we made a copy of it and put it in the store. So all we have to do now is just map over that copy and check out all the users in it, in that little mock database that we had, which was basically an array of three elements.
Okay, so, and we're not going to call this users. Let's call this something like um, user check. This is our array. And this will be an array because this higher order function map actually creates an array here. So this array will have basically one value if we're able to make a match at all. If we find no matches, it'll have three null values or three elements that are all null. In this case, because we're going, we expect to get at least one match, then we'll have an array of three elements where two of the elements are null and one is an actual user. Okay, so we're going to use this as our check array. All right, and then we'll define an empty array called users. And we won't skip const, let's use let. And then what we'll do is we'll loop over that user check array using the for each method. And we'll say for each element in that array, we'll just say basically if there is an element at all and it's not null, then we will push it to the user's array. Oh, element. Did I say item or element? Okay, good. Sometimes I write element in one line and item on the next. All right, so now we're only going to push this one element because there's only going to be one non-null element in this user's check array. So we're going to push one value to this array, which means that if there's an element at all, this the largest this array can be is an array of one element. All right. So we're going to say if there is a user's array, right, and it has that element at the zeroth index, that one element, then what we'll do is we'll return that as the user. Otherwise, we'll just return null. Okay, and then we'll put that user on the context right here. So that's simple enough. All right, so now what we need to do is we need to think about logging in. And if you check your schema and you go into your mutation type, all the functions in your mutation type, you'll see you have a login mutation, right? Or sorry, login type right here, login function here that's defined. And you're passing in an email address as a string. Right, but we don't have a resolver for it yet. And since this is a mutation, we'll have to go into our resolvers file so far, all we have are queries. We'll have to create a mutations type. So let's do that now. And then we'll define that function login. And actually, we're given the code for this in the Apollo docs. Yeah, right here. So just copy the login function part and paste that in right here. All right, so we pass in the email as an argument, and then we go into our user API. And there should be a method in the user API that allows you to find an individual user. And if you recall, we haven't created such a method yet, so we'll create it now. And we'll just call it find user. All right, we'll pass in the email to that. All right, and then assuming we do get a value back for user, which we'll check here, then what we'll do is we will encode that email into a token, and then we'll return that. All right, but first we need to go into our user API and, sorry, let's call this get user. And we'll create a method called get user. And you'll see why in a second. So we had a method before get users that got all of our users. And if you go to your GraphQL playground, you see that I have a query for users right here, and that gave us all the users in the database, right, of which there were three. Today we're going to focus on just this first user, and that's the way we're going to set up our logic, so we won't be able to um, log in these two users yet. But today, just to get us started, we'll set it up so that we can log in this one user here. All right, so create a function called getUser. 
All right, and pass in as an argument the email address. And we'll say that if there's a context, and there's a user on the context, then we'll say the email equals this.context.user.email. Otherwise, it just equals email arg. Okay. And then we'll go ahead and search the database for a user with that email. say the user and we're going to just map over the entire uh, users array which comes from our store All right, so basically, if there is a user in the database with the email that we're passing in, then we'll return that user. And again, this is going to be an array since we're using the higher order map function here. All right, so we're going to have to just extract one value from that array so that we can return it. All right, so we'll do the same thing we did before. Actually, let's make this simple. Because here, what we're going to do is if we try to, sorry, getting ahead of myself here, just to show you what I'm doing. If we try to return the user as is, right, this isn't gonna work because this is an array. We would need, if we want to return an individual user, we would need to get an element at a certain index. Now here, just arbitrarily saying, use the first uh, zero index to get the first user. It might make sense because today I told you we're only going to be looking at the, the first user in the database, but in general, we don't want to do that, All right? So we want to keep track of the index, right? So here we can define an index variable, initialize it to zero. And then we can say here, if we do find that user with an email that matches our email input, then we can say that the index equals this dot store dot users dot index of and then user right then we can just say here this will be index All right so we should be able to return a user now so now that we have this user in our resolver our login uh, mutation, then we will be able to encode our email address and get a token. So let's try that now. Go into your GraphQL Playground, and if you don't have one yet available, <coughs> type in mutation and login and the email address that we're going to log in with. And remember, it's going to be this one here. All right, if you log in, you get that token. Now this token, it doesn't matter how many times you log in or log out, it's always going to be based just on the user's email. So it's going to be the same token every time. And that's not very secure. In the next video, we'll be using JSON Web Token to more strictly authenticate users. But for this time around, just to get to used to using the context for authenticating users, we're going to keep it simple. But anyway, this is the token that we get when we log in. And we'll use that 
We'll attach that to our authorization header later to actually perform another mutation called save record. All right, and actually let's go ahead and look back at our schema. You see that we had the login mutation here, but we also have a save record mutation, and this will allow you to take a particular earthquake record of interest that you get from the earthquake catalog and attach it to your user's profile. All right, and the response object looks like this, and this is its own type, and it has three fields, right, that are to, one of which is required, that's the success field, it's non-nullable, as we say uh, in GraphQL land. So let's go ahead and create a resolver for this save record. So go back into your resolvers, and underneath your login, you can do a save record mutation. And this will take as a value a, something called record ID. We'll also pass in our data sources. And We'll just call this results for now. And the function that we're going to create in our user API will also be called save record. And we'll pass in that record ID as a parameter. All right, so before we go any further, let's go ahead and write that method in our user API. So underneath our get user method, create another one called save record. All right. So what we'll do now is we'll get since we expect there to be a user logged in, we'll get that user ID. Okay. And then we'll say that just this is for our own checking purposes. We'll say that there, if there isn't a user on the context, meaning, yeah, I mean, basically, if there's no user on the context, then we'll return that value to the console. Otherwise, there's a user on the context. Sorry guys, it's late. My typing skills already poor to begin with are even worse. All right. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and we'll look at the users in the database and we'll see if we can find a user with a matching ID. So let's use that same array value. We'll call it user check again. And again, we'll map over all the users in the database. Now, looking here, you may wonder why before 
when I check to see if a user's email matched the email that we passed in, before I used a deep equals, but this time around I'm only using a shallow equals. And if you're wondering why, you only need to look at the schema to see that the value that we're passing in here is an ID type, right? And that's something that you'll, that's one of the uh, GraphQL types. But in our database, our IDs are string types, right? So the values will equal, but they won't be the same type, right? So we'll use a shallow equals here. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so we have this array, and it should have one user and then two null values in it. Okay, so we'll, we'll do what we did before. We'll say let users equal an empty array. And then we'll loop over the user check array using the for each method. And we'll just say if there's an element there, a non-null element, then we'll push it to the user check. Array. Actually, I don't know what's going on. It's probably really late at night and I'm a little bit tired here. What we really want to do is if we find the user with the ID that we're passing in, we want to add the record to that user's um, to that user's records uh, to that user's profile. So what we should be doing here is, and let me get rid of this. We might have to come back to it, but for now, it's not necessary, and I don't want to overcomplicate things. First, what we'd like to do is. push that value, user.records.push, and to keep it simple, we'll say ID and record ID. We want to push that record ID value to, or sorry, we want to create an object that just has the ID value, has no other information, and we want to push that object to the uh, records array that's attached to the user's profile. All right, I completely just blew over that because I got into robot mode there. But once we do that, then we'll be able to check and see if we actually were able to save it successfully. All right, and of course, after we do that, we will want to return the user. So for checking purposes. All right, and now we can say, we want to look at that user and look at the um, their records array and see how long it is, All right? Because Right now, that user that we're going to check, and that's M. Bolton, has one, two, three, four earthquake records uh, on his profile attached to that records array. So we want to check and see if there's more than four, right? After we've made our attempts to uh, save that record. And if there is more than four, we know we've been successful. So for now, what we'll do is we'll We'll do what we were going to do before. We'll loop over the users user check array. So that'll give us our user back. It'll create this array of one element. All right, and then what we can do is we can return that list of records if it is longer than the 
list of records that we started with, which was a length of four. So we'll say users zero dot records dot length is greater than four. Then we'll return users zero dot records. Otherwise, we'll return an error. All right, let's see if that makes sense. So what we did was we pushed this new uh, record onto the user's list of records, or we attempted to, and then we returned that user to our user check array. And then we grabbed that user out of that array and we said that if the length of that user's records list was longer than four, or is longer than four, then we're going to return that records list attached to that user. Otherwise, we're just going to return an error. Okay, so if we go back to our resolvers, right, what we need to do is we need our save record resolver, excuse me. Like I said, it's getting tired and, and not only is my typing bad, <laughs> my thinking and my speech are really muddled. All right, but we're going to return an object that looks like this, right? Remember in the schema, we need three fields, right? Success, message, and records. So for success, what we'll do is we'll say, if results, let's make it a ternary function. If results dot length, meaning there's an actual array that has an element, at least one element in it, then we'll return true. Otherwise we'll return false or message. We're going to use the same check right, results dot length. And then we'll say quake data successfully saved. Otherwise, quake data not, not saved. And then finally, we'll return the records, which will be the results. Okay, so, so that should do it. Now that we're logged in, and recall we logged in a moment ago, we got this token here. Now that we're logged in, we can pass this token, and we can attach it to the authorization header and then make our request. So if we go in here and we do a save record mutation, And we pass in the record ID and we'll just give it an arbitrary value of one, two, three, four. Of course, we'll return success, message, records, and then for the records, we need to pass in a list of subfields and we'll just take ID. That's all we care about. All right, and we go down to our authorization header and we pass in the token we had before. It will be the exact same one, but just to be uh, methodical, we'll paste that one in there. You see that it didn't change. And then we'll run our mutation here. And we see that it says here, the Quake data was successfully saved. We have our original four objects or our four Quake events. And then we have the new record attached to it. Of course, these other Quake events have a lot more information available, right? For example, uh, we can type in magnitude, right? And if we rerun the query, all of these previously, the Quake events that we had previously stored all have magnitudes associated, but these new events that we just added, and I just added another one, uh, they have no magnitude. The only value that we attached was the ID. But we know that we are successfully saving Quake events to user profiles now. So that works. And basically that's how you 
you can do authentication simply with the context in uh, the Apollo server. Next time we'll get into more um, strict methods of user authentication using JSON Web Token. But for now, I hope that this helped you gain some insight into how valuable um, using context to authenticate users can be in your Apollo GraphQL project. Anyway, thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.